Welcome to the Grow My Salon Business podcast, where we focus on the business side of hairdressing. I'm your host, Anthony Whitaker, and I'll be talking to thought leaders in the hairdressing industry, discussing insightful, provocative, and inspiring ideas that matter. So get ready to learn, get ready to be challenged, get ready to be inspired, and most importantly, get ready to grow your salon business. Hey, it's Anthony Whitaker here, and welcome to today's podcast. Now, in case you don't already know, video versions of our podcast are now available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to put faces to the names, then head on over to Grow My Salon Business on YouTube and like and subscribe to the channel so that you never miss an episode. So with that said, on with today's show. If you currently own a salon business, it is inevitable that the day will come when the business will no longer be yours. It's just a matter of whether you sell the business or alternatively that you close the doors and end up walking away from it at the end of the lease. Now, in most cases, when you first opened your salon, you were not preoccupied with the idea of selling, but somewhere in the back of your mind, there is the idea that the day will come that you'll sell it. And often you think that when that happens, that that will be your big payday. But the problem is that most people do not sell the business. In fact, over 80% of businesses that go to market never even get an offer and instead they simply close the doors and end up walking away. Now, my guest on today's podcast is Zach Dogar, a business broker and exit strategy specialist who also specializes in the hair and beauty industry. Now, in today's podcast, we will discuss how to establish the value of a salon business, the biggest mistakes that buyers and sellers make, and how to achieve the best sale price for your salon business, and lots more. So, with that said, without further ado, welcome to the show, Zach. Oh, hi, Anthony. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. It's uh, it's going to be great having you here because, as I said at the beginning of the intro, you know, you're not going to have this business forever. Most of our audience are salon owners, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me that a lot of them sort of bank the future of their business being on the day they sell it, that that's when they'll get a payday. And as I saw on your website, which we'll put the details up for later on, you know, 80% of businesses never even get an offer. I nearly fell over when I, you know, read that statistic. So I know there's going to be a lot of really good information in this to sort of help people as salon owners set their business up so that when the day comes to sell it, that uh, they manage to, to sort of capitalize on their years of hard work and sacrifice. So let's jump in. I want to start off by just asking you a, a, a very sort of generalized question, first of all, as a as a broker, mm. who do you work for? Do you work for the buyer or do you work for the seller or do you work for both? Oh, well, g- good question. And um, often uh, it's a valid question because the waters can get muddy, muddied, especially if you've got a broker that's really motivated by getting a commission. But um, I categorically work for the seller. My best interests lie with the seller, uh, and that's you know that's my client. That's that's the person who, whose behalf I'm acting. Of course, um, one does get to know a lot of the acquirers on a personal level, but um, always um, it's the client's interests that are, that come first. Right. Okay. Now you're based in the UK. I'm based in the UK. As I spoke about with you earlier on, we have a very global audience. Um, And I'm sure that most of what we talk about today, if not all, is going to be relevant to people no matter where they are. That the things that you need to consider when buying and selling a business are probably very global in their application. But I'm going to imagine that there might be some differences in things like tax and stuff like that. So um, as much as possible, we'll keep the conversation in a sort of a, a globalized uh, format. Yeah. Now, as I said to you earlier on, you know, I've done a couple of podcasts. I'll put the links to them in the show notes for today's episode. But I've done a couple of podcasts earlier on where I have talked about buying and selling businesses, but I'm not a pro. And it was great when uh, I first came across you to to have the conversations that we had so that I, I know I can bring your professionalism and your expertise to it because like, you know, cutting hair. Anyone can pick up a pair of scissors and do a haircut, but, you know, some people are experts and anyone can, 
give their five bobs worth, so to speak, of what you should do when you're selling a business. But at the end of the day, if you've got an expert, it's going to be much more successful. So what I find as a business coach is that salon owners will often have very unrealistic valuations for their business. And it'll be based on, they'll tell me about the, the amount of money they spent on their fit out or the current revenue. They'll talk about the loyalty of the team staying on and, you know, the goodwill, meaning that the, the clients will be staying and the reputation they've built up. And as I point out to them, you've talked about a lot of things there, but a lot of those things don't actually have that much impact on how you really do value a business. So you're the expert. You tell us, uh, how do you, if I was selling a salon today and I said, so, you know, Zach, I want you to value my business. What does that look like? What are the, the things that you would take into consideration? Okay. Well, the first and foremost thing is that um, most brokers don't really value a business. <laughs> they'll, they'll speak to the client. They'll have a chat with them. They'll find out what they would like to achieve for the business. And based on that, the business goes on the market. And this is one of the reasons that very few of them sell. Um, so just turning it upside down, uh, I'm a qualified valuer. I value businesses. And um, the first thing that we do in order to actually make a decision as to whether the business is sellable or whether it should go onto the market or not, is actually do a formal valuation. And there are various methods that one can use in order to do a valuation of a, of a salon particularly. But um, the, the main ones that I use um, is market comparables. So you're actually taking a, salons that have sold. And um, because over the last 20 to 25 years, we, we've literally got loads of deals which we've put together. So we've got a database of lots of different metrics where we can match those metrics with with the current uh, salon that we're looking to value. So those metrics are used, market comparables. Also, we need to look at, this is a key thing, I think. Um, we need to look at the business from the perspective of an acquirer. Now, the difference between a seller looking at their business and an acquirer are two completely different things. So just to give you an example, a salon owner, will uh, be focusing on their client relationships, which is, which is right, because they want them to come back. Whereas an acquirer is looking for revenue potential. So they're looking at other options that could exist, other revenue streams. Are there subscription models in place? Are there any type of recurring revenue streams? A, a salon owner will look at things like client feedback. Well, uh, an acquirer is looking at business metrics. They're looking at KPIs. Got it, okay. So. When I talk about, you know, points to consider, tell me if I'm wrong on any of these things. I don't, I don't think I'm wrong. It's just a matter of, of I think I'm missing out a lot of other stuff to consider as well when sure. it comes to valuing a business. Yeah. I, I put down a list of things. I say, okay, the first thing you need to consider is how much time you've got left on the lease. Because if I'm trying to sell a business today and it's only got six months left on the lease, yeah. then that's a very different scenario to selling a business that's got a five-year lease on it. So um, is that a consideration that you would factor in? Well, well no, not really. Um, and the main mm. reason is because, first of all, um, we need to check the lease to make mm -hmm. sure that there's an automatic right to renew, first of all. Um, now, if there was only six months left on the lease, um, I would already have contacted the landlord mm. and I would have encouraged the person who's going to market to contact the landlord, let them know that, look, um, I know that negotiations will be starting shortly for a new lease. However, we're looking to find a buyer. And then and and I will establish a relationship with the landlord very early on right. so that they understand that we're going to market. Uh, I understand what their particular criteria is, because obviously, especially nowadays, um, landlords are very fussy about who they want as tenants. But mm -hmm. the short of it is that um, there will be a new lease drawn up. So if I go to market with, with a business that's got six months left on the lease, what we'll be doing is we'll be speaking to the landlord and saying, look, or, or the landlord's agent, whoever it is. So, so again, um, you know, it's not really an issue provided yeah. the deal is handled correctly. So, OK, um, the next point that I want to ask you about that a lot of people get hung up on is they'll say, 
In terms of the fit out that I've done on the salon, I spent a hundred grand on the salon. So the salon owes me back that hundred grand. And I'll say to them, but look, you know, that was five years ago. And basically it's now secondhand furniture. And anyone new who's going to come in here is going to pretty much often throw it out. So the value of that is gone. Whereas if they said, we just did a fit out six months ago and spent a hundred grand on it, then that's obviously got some, you know, component in the valuation. Would I be right in saying that? Uh, Okay. We can look at this. Um, in two ways. Um, there will be a balance sheet. And on the balance sheet, mm. there will be an assets column. And that is generally used as a uh, a figure for the assets. So when you are looking to value a, a, a business, you're looking at the goodwill element, which is uh, all those other things apart from physical assets. And you add to that the physical assets. Um, so in the case of somebody who's um, owned these assets or just only just invested, they're likely to get a majority of it back. And they normally um, depreciate uh, in a linear 20% over five years. So so after year one, it will probably be 80,000, et cetera, et cetera. So the other way to look at this is um, that when the acquirer, and and this is is to do with um, assets that are over five years old, let's say, and they don't really appear on on the assets um but on the balance sheet mm. um clearly there is something there that the acquirer is going to benefit from and, and obviously we want to do the best we can for our client mm. so what, what we can do is um when i'm doing the valuation i'm able to adjust the asset sheet um to reflect um things like stock things like uh, value of equipment as it might um, equate to a resale value. Now that's never accurate, but what it does is it puts a score on the board that we can yeah. we can look at negotiating. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay. Um, when you are looking at, you know, this is the other thing that people will do is, oh, obviously if you're buying something, yeah. your advisor is going to say to you, well, you need to get their accounts for the last three years or whatever. And it needs to be, you know, three years of profit and losses so that we can go through there and have a look at what the numbers have been in terms of how profitable the business has been. Um, does that does that sound like the right approach? Now, I say three years because often people can fudge something for a year. But if you look at three years worth of financial history, it, it's, you know, you're seeing the reality of what really happened. So. Would that be what you would suggest that you would be looking at, you know, data, financial data, profit and loss, financial statements for the last three years to get a real reflection so that you can put a value on it? Um, Depending on the length of the business. Mm -hmm. And obviously we've had COVID, which has really spiffied all the figures. And so, as you can imagine, valuations have been very interesting. However, uh, I tend to use uh, five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially with a business that's been around a long time, um, mainly because um, you've, you've had this pre-COVID period where the business has been really successful. And then you've got COVID where there's this uncertainty for a couple of years. And then you've got the rebound, which I yeah. call it. Um, mm-hmm. So in order to get a really good um, picture of um, the, the financial performance of the business, I've been sort of using the last five five years and I would recommend five years because that gives a more consistent picture. Um, also, it's important to uh, get some cash flows together to understand what the what the uh, the next five years are going to be looking like. Mm-hmm. OK, because, again, um, an acquirer is not. Yes, they're concerned about what how the business has been performing financially, but more importantly, they're going to buy the business based on the future performance of the business for the next five years. So if you've, if you've got a business, the last three years, are just the trajectory has been going up and lots of changes have been made. Um, and you should always sell a business when it's at its peak. And there are some clients that do that. Then, you know, you need to take into account the future cash flows. Um, but yeah, I, I think five years because of the circumstances that we have. And the caveat to that is that an acquirer, will be particularly interested in the last sort of 12 months or so because 
that will give them a realistic picture of what's been happening just in the last year or so. So that will be, they'll be looking to hone in on that mm. period just to see how things are going. And often um, we do, um, so if, for example, we, we've done a valuation six months ago, they'll also want to see up-to-date management accounts. So it's really important that while we're on the market that I have good access to accountants so that yeah. we can keep the momentum going on a deal because they'll often, often they'll complete looking at the last month's figures because mm -hmm. they're, they're projecting how they're, they're doing their own cash flows for the, for the next few yeah. years. So yeah. it's accommodating okay. the two. It's the seller. Yes, we're acting for the seller, but also in order to make the transaction easy, to make the transaction good, to try and get the best value, we need mm. to think about what the acquirer requires as well. Yeah, yeah. So right at the beginning, you said um, the first thing you have to determine is whether the business is even sellable. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, if you looked at the three years P&L or five years P&L and it was just breaking even all the time, would that constitute the fact that it's just not sellable? I mean, I think the reality of the situation is that I suppose 80 to 90 percent of the business is going to be judged on its financial performance. Um, mm. So it's hard for me to persuade an acquirer to purchase a business which uh, and to pay money for it mm. when it's not making any money. Um, so unless there's any compelling reason, for example, strategic, um, where they may say, look, well, we'll give you a token goodwill gesture of X amount, but mm. we know that it's going to take, I don't know, 100K for us to invest in the business to take it yeah. forward. But yeah. as a general rule, um, as a general rule, unsellable businesses, if you're not making a profit, it's going to be tough to sell. Right. OK. Uh, last point that I came across just recently, someone said to me in her valuation, she said that she'd given herself uh, that uh, when she was breaking down the justification of it, she said, well, I've got a client list of 10,000 clients. Yeah. Uh, email addresses and uh, I've got social media. I've got 25,000 followers yeah. on social media. So that is worth X dollars. What do you say to that? Do you say there's value in that or not value in that? Uh, well, it, it, it depends on uh, who's looking to buy it and um, everybody will have a different, every buyer will have a different valuation. So mm. let's say I approach the salon next door. And I said, look, uh, I've got a client who's got you know, a list of 10,000, blah, 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 blah. They may be interested. Um, yeah. I have never sold a business purely on that basis in, in 25 years. Uh, I wouldn't take on an instruction like that because the chances of success are very low. And even if they were successful, the amounts involved um, wouldn't really justify me sort of being involved in something like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's, um, I, I mean, I sort of think of that sort of thing as being all smoke and mirrors. You know, you've got, I, I, okay, you've got, you've got names and addresses, yeah, but you know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. But in, in this yeah. day and age of of uh, of data and and social media, there is obviously value in some cases for some people. Um, so, so what would you say the biggest mistakes are that sellers make? If there if there were just two or three, just short, you know. Um, mistakes that you think that someone would make that you come across again and again what would they be uh not having an exit strategy not having thought it through not having a formal valuation done so that you know where they stand and not having due diligence and having prepared the business ready for sale right okay what what about the other way around what are the biggest mistakes that you see buyers make uh, well buyers Buyers, by and large, um, they won't buy a business unless they've got the blessing of their accountant and their financial advisors. So, mm. you know, although emotionally they might like a business and they might love the owner, um, you know, th there's a financial reality where they have to show the accounts to their accountant and the accountant will sort of bring them back to um, back to reality. Um those that don't do that, those that just buy off off emotion because they they like the business, they like the brand, they like the owner, that's a mistake because uh, you're not looking at it as a uh, as a business. You, you're, you're more interested in how you feel about it. Um, I, I think that 
keeping your emotions out of uh, a business purchase and sale indeed mm. is is one of the key things yeah yeah i mean i um have heard all sorts of stories over the years about you know people that sell stuff and this goes right back to what i was talking about before with the three years p and l or five years p and l uh, and they will say, well, look, what's not showing on the books is a certain amount of money that I've been just taking out of the business cash. And so that's not, you have to trust me, it's in the business, but I take another 50 grand out in cash or whatever. And so that's how I've arrived at these valuations and that, you know, buyers have believed that or they've accepted that. And that is, that is crazy, isn't it, to do that? You, you, are, you are not buying a business based on some hearsay about a certain amount of cash that's miraculously disappearing. You're buying it based on the trading accounts, the financial statements that are filed with the, you know, the, the relevant tax departments at the end of the year sort of thing. Yeah. I, I had a client um, who had a very successful business, clearly, and um, I was stunned uh, when I looked at the accounts because it just didn't add up. Mm. And he said to me, come and have a look at my car. <laughs> yeah, come yeah. and have a look at my house. Yeah. <laughs> well, come on, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I know someone that put a, a, a $95,000 kitchen in and tried to run it through the business, uh, but the kitchen was at home. You know <laughs> I mean? It wasn't the same, like, for God's sake. And so, again, they tried to factor that in as, yeah. you know, it doesn't show on the statement on the P&L but yeah. you know trust me this money exists in the business yeah, yeah. okay um you just touched on uh when I asked about mistakes you, you touched on um exit strategies yeah. when you open a business you know I, I I was 31 when I opened my first salon you're not thinking about an exit strategy oh. But I deal with a lot of people that are in their 50s, sometimes in their 60s, and all of a sudden, you know, an exit strategy is a very real thing. And as I said at the beginning in the intro, there's a point in time is going to come where you're no longer going to own your business. It's just a matter of whether you sell it or whether you close the doors and walked away. So when you talk about an exit strategy, how far ahead should a salon owner be planning, be starting to put the pieces in, in place. Because one of the very important ones, and again, you sort of touched on it right at the beginning, was uh, extracting your revenue that you're producing in the business. Because if you're putting, I don't know, imagine you're a salon owner and you're putting 150 grand a year through the business and services that you're generating. Well, when you leave, that 150 grand is going to leave with you, let's assume. So, you know, I often say to people, you should gradually be extracting yourself from the business over a period of three years. So it's not reliant on the revenue that you're producing the sale price. Is that sound advice? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the most successful sales that I've had is working with clients for about three years, preparing the business for sale. Um, I think that Actually, you know, I've come up with this adage with a business. Every business decision that you're making in the salon is going to either increase or or, or lower your value. So mm. every time you book in a call and you do that call, you, you do that treatment, you're slightly depleting the value of the company. Every time you pass that on to one of your team, you're then slightly increasing the value of that. Every time... You have to ring a supplier to place an order. You're slightly depleting the value of your business. Every time you're empowering your staff to do these things, staff rotors, everything that is um, important in the day-to-day -day running of the business, the more, the more of it that is being done by your team, the slowly you're etching up the value of your company. Mm. Um, so um, it's just having that awareness that any action that's being taken how is this affecting the value of my business? And just having that sort of mindset in the back of your mind. Um, but I think you're right. Sort of three years is an ideal time. Um, generally, I find that people come to me when they've had a health scare mm, yeah. or when suddenly a competitor's uh, opened up next door or um, suddenly staff have left <laughs> and they've got a depleted team. Mm. Now, that's actually the worst time to be looking yeah. to sell your business. So mm. um, it's very important to, to have these things in place 
um, well before you go to market so that when you go to market, I mean, really, what I'm doing is making my job as easy as possible. If I'm putting a fantastic opportunity in front of an acquirer, which is absolutely a no brainer, I'm going to have five or six offers on the table. And that's mm. really ideally what we want, that the business just sells itself. Mm. Um, and that's what we work towards. So, so the clients that I've had that I've worked with for three years plus, we've actually had that. We, we've been in and out of, of the market very, very quickly. Of course, another thing to bear in mind is that if your business is on the market, it is very vulnerable. And the longer it stays on the market, mm -hmm. uh, the more vulnerable the business becomes. So it's got to be a very smart and smooth operation. And yeah. that's what you end up with if you've really planned. I mean, the old adage, uh, Anthony, if you fail to prepare, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Mm, yeah, exactly. In line with that, uh, one thing that I'm often presented with is an owner who wants to stay on. They want to sell the business, but they then want to stay on and only work yeah. one day a week or two days a week or whatever. Uh, what's your advice about that? Um, I like that um, purely because an acquirer, when they are buying a business or a salon, what they want to do is they want, I mean, let's face it, the team is the business. You know, the, mm. the guys that are on the workstations doing the work, they're the guys that are producing the income. That's the revenue that's then... Um, you know, sort of the lifeblood of the business. And uh, the acquirer is going to be looking to keep the team exactly as it is. So if you've got a team and you've got the owner who, who has been hands-on and they're used to having him on the, him or her on the floor, um, it works fantastically well. And it's another selling point, i.e. we've not got the leader suddenly drifting off and the acquirer wondering, well, actually, is this team going to start falling apart now because the spearhead's there no longer? Um, Secondly, it allows um, the owner to slowly leave the business over a period of time. Um, and also, um, it, it, you know, it maintains stability. You know, a lot of, you know, he's not that person's not suddenly passing on their client base to somebody else. Mm. So um, salons where the owner is staying on for a period of time tend to make the acquirer more comfortable that they're inheriting a business that's going to have continuity. So certainly he, I do encourage that. Yeah. I can, I'm going to reflect some downside to that. Sure. Sure. Of course. When you talk about the acquirer, um, are you talking about like a party that is going to buy the business, but not actively be involved in it or. Yeah. La largely. Yeah. Largely. Um, right. Okay. Acquirer stands for anybody that's buying a business, but yeah. Yeah. Most of the, most of the most of the buyers that I deal with, um, they will want a business that is able, managed or able to be managed and run from afar. Right. So uh, they're not, they don't want to get in there and get behind the chair and yeah. build up the, right. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. If you've, got, yeah. if you've got a business that relies on the owner, mm. then really, realistically, only another stylist will buy it. Mm. And that stylist will have to be within a 20 to 25 mile radius. And so it becomes much, much more difficult to, to find a buyer for that for that type of business. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Because often I, when I do see that, um, yeah. when the owner stays on and they've sold to a team member, there's often problems because the team member wants to start making changes to the culture and the prices and this, that, and the other. And the former owner finds it very difficult to let go. Yeah. So I can see there's advantages and disadvantages with both. And yeah, as you it just said, it, depends, uh, it depends, yeah. depends on the team and the people that you're working with. So, um, I mean, the average amount of uh, appointments or meetings that we will have anything from 30 to 50 meetings with different acquirers, um, you know, uh, 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 accountants, et cetera, et cetera, during the transaction. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I like to do is encourage uh, dialogue between a buyer and a seller, especially if the seller is going to stay on so that they can understand each other, they can build a relationship and they can see if they can work together or not. Um, and that's very important. So, if a seller is looking to stay on in the business, then we need to find somebody that they can work with. So mm -hmm. as the transaction unfolds, you do kind of get to 
understand each other uh, and, the, and the parties uh, can see whether there's uh, the ability to work together or not. But more often than not, because the motives, the, the success of the salon are aligned, mm. it does tend to work out. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, last couple of things before we wrap up. What should you look for if you're a salon owner and you're, you know, obviously you're based in the UK, so people listening to this outside of, you know, the UK uh, 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 don't have the opportunity to work with you. But if you, if you were selling your business, you were in the United States or in Australia, or whatever, and you were thinking, right, okay, I'm going to go to a broker. What should you look for when you're uh, choosing to sell through a broker? What would be the top two or three things you'd say, look out for these things? Okay. I think, I think the first thing is that selling a salon is a very specialist uh, field. Um, I have had to pick up the pieces of transactions where whole teams have left because mm. the sale hasn't been handled in the correct way. So experience in the industry is key. Uh, check out testimonials. Um, I think it's very important. Um, and have a look at how others have been treated and, uh, the, the journey, what it's like, what it's been like for them. Um, and also I think, um, also, another key one is the contacts that they have within the industry. You know, how are they mm. going to market the business? Are they qualified uh, to value? Are, have they got the right credentials? Um, nowadays, you can go on LinkedIn, ask them if there is a valuation that they've given you, question it. Ask them, you know, put, put it to the test. Ask them why they've valued it to that. Get them to produce um, some past deals that they've done to justify that value. Um, but I think oh, 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 you do your due diligence because uh, I think probably about 90 percent of business brokers um, aren't really up to the mark, in my opinion. Certainly in the UK. I don't know. We, our industry is unregulated. Hardly mm. anybody's qualified. Mm. So it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit like the Wild West out there, unfortunately. Well, in terms of brokers. In terms of brokers, yeah. Right, okay, got it. Uh, very last thing I wanted to to uh, mention, and this came up with someone recently. Um, she had a business. So let's just say there were 10 stylists in it. And, and let's say that each stylist was generating $100,000 a year. Uh, so you've got a, a you know a million dollar a year business. Sure. Now, she was saying, I've got a million dollar a year business. But what she hadn't anticipated was that she doesn't have a million dollar a year business because all of those stylists are renters there. So the million dollars or the hundred thousand a year that each of those stylists is producing is the stylist business. They're a independent business unit of one. The person who owned the salon was getting whatever they were getting, let's just for round numbers say it was $200 a week from each of those stylists for rent. So what the person who owned the business really had was revenue based on 10 stylists times $200 a week. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they had a business that was generating $2,000 a week that they were trying to sell, not a business that was generating a million dollars a year. Um, the industry is now very much going through a more uh, self-employed, independent contractor sort of uh, employment model. And a lot of people have completely misunderstood or underestimated the impact that that actually has on the saleability of a business. So uh, what are your thoughts about that before we wrap up? A um, very interesting question, and and I think you're right, Anthony. That 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 has become a trend, um, not not only because of um, salon owners, but but staff staff wanting to have that little bit more independence. Mm. I mean, and and the caveat for me is that I'm dealing uh, I'm dealing with the UK, so I only know the self employment law within the UK. So um, I can only speak about the UK, but I'm sure it's similar. Um, if you look at this from the perspective of an acquirer, they're taking on a business where they have absolutely no control over when these guys can just up sticks and go. That What I mean by that is just leave and yeah. go somewhere else and set up on their own. Mm. Obviously, if the staff are employed, there are then uh, some, some legal grounding for them to be able to dictate to them how they should work what changes can be made to the company, et cetera. 
but the, these uh, these guys are, are really mini businesses within themselves, and mm. acquirers really don't like that. Yeah, but so, more importantly, the whole valuation of the business is yeah. not based on the million dollars turnover or sales. The whole valuation of the business is, if I use my numbers, that you've got 10 staff doing $200 each a week rent mm -hmm. that they're paying the business, multiplied by 50 weeks in a year. The, the, the business that that salon owner is trying to sell has actually only got income of $100,000 a year, not a yeah. million dollars a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and just to add, I would not take on a business like that because I think it's mm. unsettled. So yeah, yeah, I yes. even and that's you just business. nailed it. It's unsellable. It's yes. unsellable. It's unsellable. Yeah. So yeah. irrespective of what you might value it at, and mm. you could do an academic exercise. The, mm. the problem is none of that income is guaranteed. Absolutely mm. none of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Well, listen. Uh, where, where can people? Uh, where can they connect with you? Either online websites or on any social media channels, etc. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for asking. Um, we have a website, um, www.ets-corporate.com, and we offer uh, free online questionnaires. One, one of the questionnaires, it, they, they're all online, um, and one is called a sellability score, um, where it takes you 13 minutes to complete this questionnaire. And if you fill out the uh, financials part of the document as well, um, we can also give you a ballpark figure for evaluation. What that does is it enables you to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your business and have a report which will then help you to understand what you need to be focusing on um, for the for the coming year and what, what your strengths are. Um, that's free. And, and also, I also offer a free consultation with that so that so that they can have some feedback from me so we can relate it personally to their business. Well, so I'll... I'll put those links on our website, growmysalonbusiness.com, and in the show notes for today's podcast, we're on whatever device you're listening to it on. So to wrap up, Zach, thank you for being on this week's episode of the Grow My Salon Business podcast. Pleasure, Anthony. Thank you very much for the invite. No, it's been good. It's been very informative. So thank you. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you'd like to connect with us, you'll find us at growmysalonbusiness.com or on Facebook and Instagram at growmysalonbusiness. And if you enjoyed tuning into our podcast, make sure that you subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Until next time, this is Anthony Whitaker wishing you continued success.